Hi, it's Barbara Heidenreich. I'm here. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Everyone said I should introduce Barbara, but Barbara needs no introduction. A good friend and a real expert on having your corporate parent, because Barbara's the one who so let me just turn the floor over to Barbara. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I hope you hope you well. Looks like you can see me. I saw waves back. That's awesome. All right. Well, I am going to tell you first off. If you have a camera or a camera phone, you might want to um, get it out because I am going to put some things up here for you guys to look at, and you might want to take a picture of them and have it for your records. So as you guys know, you were, you were invited to send me questions about different parrot behavior problems and I selected a few here to go ahead and answer right now. But then what we'll do for the last 15 minutes or so is um, I'll, have, uh, I'll have you guys ask questions and, and see what we can do in the last few minutes. It's, I will say it's a little difficult to see you all, I think because there's a big bunch of light coming from behind you. So I may have um, Terry or somebody pick the people for me. All right, so I'm going to start with the first question here, and it came from Lizzie, and Lizzie says she can't find a way to reward her black-capped Lori. She said she can no longer handle him, but her other hookbills are great pets. So obviously, finding something that your bird values is really important for animal training, and a lot of times one of the easy things to use is food. And one of the easiest ways to identify your favorite, your bird's favorite food treats are to look at what's the first thing he eats out of the food bowl when you give him his diet in the morning. It might be, um, like for my Amazon, he loves apple, he loves um, oh, cooked uh, squash. So if I have some cooked uh, butternut squash in there, he'll do just about anything for that. A lot of times it's seeds and nuts. So what you can do is you can save those items for training. You can still give them to them in their diet if you want to, if you're not going to need to reinforce any good behaviors that day. But you do want something that the animal's going to go for. So typically with our bigger parrots like macaws and Amazons and um, all that, saving out the seeds and nuts works really well. Break them up into small pieces. I've had, I had a few emails where people were like, I give my, my, give, I give my green cheek con your half an almond when he does something good. And I go, oh, half an almond, that's a huge amount of food for a little green cheek con You could break that up into 20 pieces and you'll have 20 different opportunities to reinforce your parrot with that piece of almond. So always keep that in mind. Break it up into small pieces, save the preferred food items for training. Now with a black cap lorry, one of the cool things about lorries and lorikeets is that they are primarily fruit and nectar eaters, so they actually process food really, really fast. So a great treat for a lorry is something like a grape, but again, not a whole grape. You're going to take that grape and you're going to break it up into little, little tiny pieces. And um, same with, with apple. Apple's another one they like. It's pretty messy though because what lorries and lorikeets like to do is they kind of squish it and they squeeze out all the juice. So another great option for those kinds of parrots is to get a syringe and fill it full of nectar or you can sometimes use apple juice and just let your, because lorries have the, the little brushy tongue that they can stick into plants to get the, the sweetness out there, they can stick their tongue right into the syringe. You actually don't even have to press it very much to, to let them get what, a little taste. So I actually use just a little drop of nectar or juice to reinforce a lorry if I'm training a lorry. Um, so if your bird doesn't, and, and for your bird, if it's not a lorry or a lorikeet, you still could train it to take fluids from a syringe, and that can be used to reinforce behavior. And, um, oh gosh, I don't have a banner to show you on that, where to get, I, I do have an ebook on that, <clears throat> on how to train that behavior. The cool thing about it is because if your bird does ever get sick, you have taught him to take fluids from a syringe. So that way, when, med when it's time to medicate, you can actually start teaching him to take medication from a syringe. I always get the question, what if the medication tastes bad? <laughs> and believe it or not, you can get them to taste bad taste or take bad tasting medication. You just have to back it up with something good. So even if you're giving something that tastes good or doesn't taste bad at all, like water, you always want to back it up with a really good thing afterwards. So for my Amazon, it might be a piece of apple, it might be some cooked uh, squash, it might be a pine nut, whatever he likes. And those of you that have smaller birds, you probably already know this, but um, birds like our cockatiels and budgerigars, they love millet spray. 
So instead of just sticking millet spray in the cage just because it's fun to let them chew on millet spray, think about millet spray as a great tool to reinforce your parrot. So save the millet spray to reinforce training. My, uh, I have two cockatiels here and I always train them on the same spot and they know where the millet spray is and if I go to open that door, they immediately fly over to that spot and they wait for, for the training session to begin because they love their millet spray. But they don't get it in their diet every day, they get it for training so that keeps it high value. Some other birds that like millet spray, um, believe it or not, eclectus parrots sometimes respond to millet spray. Um, king parrots, although I, doubt, I don't know if anybody's got a king parrot here, they're not so common in this, in this country. And also some of those smaller conures, so the green cheek conures, a lot of times they'll respond to millet spray too. So, so go ahead and experiment with those things. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to move on to the second question, unless somebody has a question about motivation that I missed. All right. Okay. What's the question? Well, let some shout it out. Oh, great question. So, if it was like a parrotlet, I would give them one little tiny seed. But if it's like a cockatiel, what I tend to do is I break off one of those little buds, you know, that's like that big, and I just let them take a couple nibbles off of that. Um, if it's just, you know, I'm just doing a quick repetition, like, you know, fly to my hand, you get a couple little bites, fly back, you get a couple little bites, fly to my hand, you get a couple little bites, step on the scale, you get a couple little bites. Make sense? Okay. All right. More questions on that? No? Okay. I'm going to move on to the second one. Let's see. Oh, this is a good one. All right. This is from Patty and Patty has an African gray and they have a problem with him biting when they are trying to clean his cage and which which as she put here is every day because when he's out of his cage oh and, and then when they go to put him back in the cage he tries to bite when they go to put him back in the cage okay and he bites hard enough to draw blood all right so i'm sure there are other people dealing with um, aggressive behavior or a parrot that bites and would like some ideas to how to address that situation. So here's some general tips first and then we'll get into specifics on Patty's question. So in general, your whole goal when you're working with your parrot is to avoid situations which create a, a, a aggressive behavior. So you want to start identifying what are those circumstances when your bird is more likely to bite. Is it when you move your hand up too fast? Um, like in this case, is it when she's trying to bring the bird back to the cage and she, know that she knows the, the bird has figured out, oh, we're going back to the cage? Um, is it maybe when the bird is sitting on its favorite person and you want to have the bird step up? Um, is it when you're trying to take food bowls out of the cage? A lot of people have the experience of a parrot that tries to attack your hands when you touch the food bowls or change toys. So first you want to try to identify those situations. And then what I always ask is, is there, could I change something about that? Like, do I have to put new toys in when the bird is in the cage? Could, do I have to change his food and water bowls when he's in the cage? Could I, could I wait till he's outside of the cage? Um, if, if we have a real issue with hands, um, maybe he'll step up on something else with, without um, showing aggressive behavior. Maybe he's okay with a stick, but maybe he's not okay with sticks or hands. If that's the case, then I'm going to think about, okay, how do I train this behavior? How do I train the animal to do what I would like him to do? So again, the first thing is not to put him in the situation where he wants to aggress. I always say you don't want to start at 100, 100 being the most difficult. You want to start at zero where the animal can be very successful. So let's say you have a parrot that you want to teach to step up on your hand. You just don't go stick your hand up into his face and hope for the best. What I try to do is I try to find a way so that the bird has the choice to come closer to my hand and every time he does, something good is going to happen like he's going to get his favorite food treat. So if I'm teaching a bird to step up, what I usually do is put my hand at the end of a perch. I make it the extension of the perch and if I'm really worried that he might bite and I can't see it coming, I'll put my hand into a tight fist because if a bird tries to bite a tight fist, they, it's harder for them to get a grip on anything, so you're less likely to get hurt if you make a mistake. But ideally, if that bird is walking towards my hand and he reaches down at all with his beak, I actually just pull my hand away. So he doesn't have the opportunity to bite it. But sometimes we're a little slow on picking up on that at first, or we have a hard time reading their body language. 
So before we even work on step up, I do train targeting where I teach the animal to orient its beak towards something. So it might be my closed fist where I'm hiding treats, or it might be a target stick. Some of you, I, oh, do I have a target stick handy? I don't. Um, some of you may have seen target sticks. You can use like a chopstick. I have one that has like a ball on the end and a clicker. So you teach the bird to orient towards that. And then what you do is you, you present that target in a way so that the bird has to take a little step towards it in order to get reinforced. And so all they're doing is orienting their beak towards it and they learn that that earns them a little goodie. So when we have them target, we have them target a little bit closer, they get a treat, a little bit closer, they get a treat, a little bit closer, they get a treat. And when they get really close to your hand and maybe they even make contact, boy, we give them a nice big treat. And we teach them that coming to our hands by your choice will result in good things, things you really like. Now, it doesn't have to be a food treat. It could be a head scratch if your parrot really likes that, um, or a toy, whatever, whatever you know your parrot likes. But the idea is that you're not going to force the bird. The bird has the choice to participate, and if he does the right thing, good things are going to happen. And eventually, we work him all the way onto the hand, and once he has enough history of doing this action, of coming, sidestepping to the hand and getting reinforced, then I start gradually putting my hand in, in more of that natural position that we're used to when we ask a par parrot to step up. But the idea is that I'm never going to push into him, I'm never going to scoop him up, I'm going to hold my hand steady, and he gets to choose to come off there. If he comes up there, he gets something that he likes. If he doesn't want to come up or he tries to bite, I take my hands away, but I also take the treats away, so he lost the opportunity to get the goodies. So that teaches him, if you come to my hand, good things are going to happen. If you tell me you don't want to, that's okay, but you don't get any goodies, okay? So that's one thing to think about. <laughs> um, but then back to the question here about cleaning the cage. So what I think about is um, there's two options for me. The first one I think about is could the bird be someplace else? Could he sit on a perch while I clean his cage so that I'm not putting him in that situation where he feels the need to show aggressive behavior? Whatever that may be. It may be territorial. It may be something else. It doesn't matter. All we know is he shows aggressive behavior under these circumstances. So can we change the circumstance? Easiest way, put him someplace else while you clean the cage. But if you're not in that situation, maybe you have a parrot that he, he doesn't step up or he's afraid to leave his cage, one, another easy behavior to train is something we call stationing. So w instead of having your bird learn to, uh, well, you'd still want him to target his beak towards something because we're going to use that to train this behavior. But we're also going to teach him to target his feet towards something. That's the other thing that, that we can get him to do. And when we, when we ask an animal to sort of stand on something or target his feet towards something, we call that stationing. And we try to increase the amount of time the parrot learns to stay on that station, okay? So if I'm going to clean a bird's cage, what I might do is I might place a certain perch in a certain part of the cage that I'm going to be, have be his station. And the criteria I have is whenever I'm going to do something in his cage, whether it's move the papers around or, or change food and water bowls, the criteria is he needs to go to his station first where I'm going to reinforce that behavior. That's a critical part of it. You just don't assume he's going to go there or you're going to chase him there. You're going to actually use your target again. And you can do this from outside the cage. You can ask him to touch a chopstick or something from outside the cage. And every time he touches that chopstick, he's going to get some, some goodies. And you can use that to lure him over to that perch that you want him to station on. When he gets to that station, that perch, give him lots of goodies. And in fact, what you want to do then is do something kind of fancy that we call put it on an intermittent schedule of reinforcement. So what that means is instead of just one treat and, and then he can walk away, you want to teach him if you stay there for a few seconds longer, you might get another treat. And then maybe it's going to be five seconds between, between treats. And then maybe it's um, this one you got at five seconds, this one you got at 10, this one you got at one, this one was at 30 seconds. What we do is we teach him that he never knows when he's going to get a treat but as long as he stays on that perch, there's a good chance he's going to get a treat while you're working in the cage area. And that's how we get nice long duration for behaviors when we use that strategy. So we can teach this guy, sit on this perch for a long period of time. Goodies will happen as long as you remain there. If he were to climb down and try to come after me, I would just walk away, close the door, wait and wait. And then I might, I might wait and see if he goes up there by himself. That would be ideal. And then reinforce. If I have it on cue, that's even better. If I give him a little point or something to the perch and then he goes back up to the perch and then I reinforce him. 
or if I need to, I can use that target to get him back into that position and reinforce him for waiting on that station. But the idea is, just like the bird that was biting at the hand, if he comes after me to try and bite me, oh, that means I go away and you lose your opportunity to get goodies. So this kind of ties back into our first question, that your parrot needs to want what you have to offer, so you want to make sure you identify what those favorite goodies are and save that for that. And to go back to the other part, well, first, first I should ask, does anybody have any questions about that part? Is that me? No questions on that part? Okay. So the next part of it is she says when, he want, when she wants to put him back in the cage, he tries to bite again. He doesn't want to go back into the cage. So I bet there's a lot of people out there that have this problem. Yes, I, I'm, I'm imagining. I see some heads nodding. Because a lot of times our parrots really enjoy our companionship, the interactions we have with them when they're outside the cage. It's very stimulating and fun. So um, the way I look at this is I like to think of um, we've got two behaviors here. We've got stay outside of the cage or go back in the cage, right? And I think of them as like a balanced scale. And this behavior of staying outside the cage means lots of good, fun things are happening. But this behavior of going back in the cage is not very fun at all. So what the bird's going to choose to do is the one that is more fun, more reinforcing for the animal. So our job uh, with any behavior, not just this behavior, is to keep it in balance. We want to make going back in the cage as much fun as staying outside of the cage. Now obviously, you can't live in the cage with your parrot and give him companionship and attention all the time with him. But we can look at other things that are reinforcers for behavior. So it might be that when it's time to go back in the cage, you've put in a whole bunch of new toys that your bird really likes, or maybe a really cool, awesome foraging toy, or maybe it's just that he gets his absolute favorite treat only when he goes back into the cage, and maybe that's like a, a whole um, peanut fur change, some, you know, a larger treat than usual. Um, you can give head scratches when a bird goes back in the cage for you. A lot of times I'll have a bird uh, step towards me. So if I've got a perch in the cage, I'll bring the bird under the perch and have him step towards me so that I can give him head scratches and attention because my companionship is reinforcing for that behavior. So always think in terms of how do I make it fun for my bird to go back into the cage. And if your bird is being reluctant, that's always a signal to you that you need to make this side of the scale have more value because it's not having very much value for your bird right now. So another part of that is when you're going to ask that bird to step up on your hand to go in the cage, absolutely reinforce as soon as that bird steps up on your hand. And then what I tend to do if I'm going to use food treats is I have a whole bunch in my hand and I actually reinforce my for, for sitting calmly on the hand as we walk towards the cage because even that can be difficult for a parrot who's learned, I don't want to go back in there, nothing fun happens in there. So I take a step, and as long as my bird is calm and relaxed, he gets a goodie. If he leans back, that's him telling me I don't want to go back in the cage. So what I do is I take a step back away from the cage until his body language is upright and calm and relaxed again. And then I offer him a goodie, and then we start working our way slowly towards the cage. Now, this is really, for me, retraining the behavior. Once your bird gets the idea that when he gets to go back to the cage, good things are going to happen, and he sort of is anticipating that, oh yeah, every time I go back to the cage, there's a new toy, or my favorite treat, or I get lots of head scratches. You won't have to do this process of every little step I need to give a treat. But in the beginning, if you've got a bird that's already learned, I don't want to go back there, you are going to have to go through some baby steps to get it back on track. But once that's done, then you're just maintaining the behavior, which is pretty easy, because you're going to do that every single day, right? All right, any questions on that one? Because I talk so much, is that it? <laughs> All right, good deal. All right, so let's see my next one here. The next one I have is from Virginia. And Virginia works at a facility that has lots of parrots. It looks like 21 parrots. And um, when they have to, to clip wings and nails, they have to wrap the birds in a towel, and, um, and then after they've finished the procedure, they give them some kind of treat or reward afterwards. But the, the staff there, which I think this is awesome, they are interested in training those birds to cooperate in that procedure instead of having to restrain them for that. And they do have a cockatoo that will allow that, who will allow nail trims and wing trims without having to be restrained. But their, their, think, their concern is that 
the reason that bird is doing it is because it has a great bond with one person. And would they actually be able to accomplish that with all these other birds? And you know, do they have to have a bond with every single bird in order to get this behavior? So this is a great question. <clears throat> And one that I, I love to talk about because um, I love uh, trying to train parrots to cooperate in their own medical care. And even though you may not think of nail trims as, you know, big medical care, um, it, you know, it, it, to them it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> and to the birds it's scary. And obviously if you have to restrain them for medical care, that's another part of that, that um, equation. So for me, this is a behavior you can absolutely train. And it doesn't require you to have a strong bond per se with the animal. One of the things that, um, when we were talking about reinforcers, you know, food is a reinforcer. Yes, companionship is a reinforcer, and touch for some animals is a reinforcer. And typically, a lot of our larger cockatoos do enjoy being touched, and we can use that um, to reinforce the animal for allowing us to manipulate feet and things like that. <clears throat> but there's lots of other strategies that we can use that don't necessarily rely on touch because some animals need a lot of trust before they're ready to let you touch them. So this is where I go back to food as being a really nice reinforcer if you can identify the favorite things that your animal likes. Um, and again, toys can work for this too, so, so don't rule out your other things. <clears throat> so the real question is though, how would you train the behavior? There's, there's a few behaviors here. One is towel restraint. If you wanted to train the bird to be comfortable with being restrained in a towel, that's one strategy that you can use to help make this behavior more comfortable for the bird. And the biggest thing with any of these medical behaviors is, is again, you don't start at 100. You start at a place where the animal is comfortable and relaxed. So with the towel, it might mean that you have that uh, spread out on a table and that the bird, you're going to use that target and have the bird walk onto the towel and give it treats for walking onto the towel. You might spread treats all over the towel and let them eat treats on the towel. Right there, we're just doing some classical conditioning. We're pairing something we know the animal likes with something that maybe it has no history with. If it has bad history with it, then we would call it counter conditioning. So once the animal's comfortable with that, I might start moving the towel a little bit and giving the bird treats for letting me move that towel. Um, there's some, and eventually work towards getting it over the bird. Another strategy I share in one of my DVDs is I like to roll um, towels up to make like a little, I don't know, two little mountains. And then I put another towel over the top so there's a tunnel. And I teach the bird to go into that tunnel so that um, we can get it used to having a towel over its body. And then what I do is I spread the, the two little mountains farther apart so that the towel gets lower and lower and lower and the bird gets more comfortable with having a towel being on its back. So and eventually you get to the point where you can manipulate it, put some pressure on. But again, you break that into steps that the bird can handle and can accomplish. Now if you want to um, train it just to allow a nail trim without the towel restraint, one of the um, strategies I do if I, if I have a bird that's sitting on a perch is if he knows how to step up, <clears throat> I can teach him to put one foot on my hand and then work on trimming each nail um, from with the one foot on my hand. And again, we break it down into small steps. You don't just go, oh, I've got his foot. Boom, here come the nail clippers. What I do is when that foot comes on my hand, I actually hide treats here and I hold the nail clippers here. So I can bring the nail clippers up and then open my hand and offer a treat. And, I, and I, sometimes I just barely touch the nails. Sometimes I'll just squeeze the scissor part a little bit so they get used to that movement. Sometimes I'll put a little pressure on the nail, but I won't clip. And then I work up to I'm actually going to clip the nail. And sometimes you can give them a little signal that says I'm about to clip so that they know when the clip is actually going to come. Of course, the, the main thing is to not uh, clip too far so that you cause bleeding or pain because that'll make it a little harder. You have to go back through your steps again. But always think of it as baby steps. If your bird is ever showing a fear response, it means you're moving too fast. You want to slow it down. And, and it might take you a couple weeks to get to the point where you can actually trim nails. But going through all those baby steps doesn't have, have to happen every time. It'll go faster and faster each time. So another strategy to trim nails, if you have a bird that doesn't really like sitting on your hand, is you can use that target again to teach them to hang on the wire in a certain spot. So you'd target their beak into a certain position so that their feet are right there. And then you would go through those baby steps of getting them used to maybe your finger touching a nail, then the nail clippers coming closer, barely touching the nail, and again, going through those baby steps. And if you are just one person, you can make a target that actually hangs on the wire, or that you clip on the wire, 
and the bird learns to orient towards that so that both your hands are free. So that's another strategy there. So the reality is, is that you don't really have to have a great bond with the bird per se because um, you don't necessarily need to be able to touch the bird, you know, in a, you know, in a head scratchy kind of way. There's other reinforcers you can use, whatever behavior it is, whether it's the towel restraint or the, the nail trimming, um, you want to break it down into small steps that the animal is comfortable with and that he can handle. Now here's where I'm going to put up one of those little signs of information because um, one of my DVDs does have all instructions on training the towel and also for um, nail trims. And then I, if you sign up for my mailing list, I actually send you three video clips of when I first trained my Amazon parrot Delbert to allow me to trim his nails. So here is all of that. Hopefully you can see it and you can take pictures. That work? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Look how clever I am. <laughs> all right. Any more questions about nail trimming? Oh, you did a great job. <laughs> I talk too much, huh? All right. <laughs> okay, well, here's one. All right, here's another one. Okay, this is from Debbie. And Debbie has a blue and gold macaw that's becoming a one-person bird. And the bird wants to lunge and try to bite anyone except for her. I'm guessing a few people out there might have that problem with one of their birds because that's another common one that we see out there. And um, so here's the thing about parrots and their reproductive behavior. Uh, you know, parrots, you know, people talk about parrots getting hormonal and things like that. So what they're talking about is when all those reproductive hormones are amplified and they're surging through their body, right? And that isn't something that's happening all the time with our parrots that's something that's triggered by certain environmental conditions. So those conditions are things like longer light cycles, um, maybe a really rich diet, like lots of um, uh, carbohydrates and fats in the diet. Another thing that contributes to it is a pair-like bond or a mate-like bond either with another bird or with a human being. And the way that that happens with humans is that we tend to do things that reinforce courtship behavior. So if your parrot you know, starts regurgitating for you and you're kind of thinking that's cute, <laughs> that could be contributing to the problem. Um, what are some other things there? Oh, if he has access to a nest cavity or a nest site. So some parrots, if you have toys in their cages that are like boxes or little happy huts, um, or if they're crawling under the couch looking for nest sites, all those things can help contribute to your bird starting to ramp up those hormones to get ready to make babies. And what happens when they have that elevated hormonal state is they're more easily triggered for aggressive behavior. So one of the things we want to avoid is getting our birds into that hormonally amped up state. So you want to try to keep your light cycles the same. You want to try to avoid overfeeding and especially watch if there's a lot of carbs and, and um, fats in the diet, sugars, things like that. Um, now, avoiding the mate-like bond, what that means is you want to be really careful about what you're reinforcing. You know, if your bird starts to show sexual behavior or courtship behaviors, that's the moment you walk away for a minute and you say, oh, when you interact with me like that, I can't play with you because then you get too, you know, crazy. So, um, so what, we, what we're doing in those moments is what we call a timeout. We're just saying, oh, you lost your opportunity to play with me. As long as you do non-sexual stuff, we can interact with each other. So you want to really be aware of that because that amplifies that bond when you reinforce the courtship behaviors. And, of course, removing anything that looks like a nest site. So that's part of the equation. Get the, get the uh, behavior back in toward a sort of homeostasis. No more of that, you know, hey, I'm ready to make babies mode. Then the other part of it is that um, I really recommend teaching some hands-off behaviors, things like a turnaround or a wave or some vocal behaviors, um, putting your wings up, behaviors that don't require anybody to touch your bird. If you train those behaviors, the person that has the relationship with the bird, um, and get them really super solid so that you know if anybody cues your bird to wave, he waves, that is a great way to start building a relationship with new people or other people in the household. So the way that works is, so let's say the person the bird doesn't like goes up to the parrot and says, you know, wave, and the bird waves, 
he can offer him a treat. And what that does is it, it gives the bird a behavior to focus on that he knows earns desired consequences. Instead of just sitting there going, oh, here comes that guy I hate. Oh, I just want to bite him. I just want to bite him. He's like, oh, yeah, wave. I like waving. Wave means good things. It has a long history of positive reinforcement. So he'll wave. He'll get that goodie. And it will help start building a relationship between that person and the bird. They may not have the same relationship as the person that the bird really prefers, like that other person may not be able to do head scratching and stuff like that, but at least they can have a bite-free relationship that's based on good consequences. Any other, qu oh, any other questions on that one? If you, if you have your, um, your, your cameras already, I have another little sign for you that relates to that. So um, I'm gonna put it up there and I'll talk at the same time. So uh, I don't publish it anymore, but I have a, I had a magazine called Good Bird Magazine. Hoping that's in the shot there. Yeah. And uh, Pamela Clark wrote an article for it all about this, this hormonal behavior and how to reduce that hormone amplification. So it's a free sample. So at goodbirdmagazine.com. Look, click on the, you'll see like a little image that's flipping pages like a magazine. Click on that image and then look for the article by Pam Clark and you can read that and that'll um, help you remember all those tips I just talked about. So it's a really good article. All right. Oh, and the second part of that question ties into the other question that I have here. Um, the other thing that happens, or what happens with that bird that only likes one person is he also screams for attention. And that's also what Debbie has a question about. She has a bird that screams whether she's, uh, whether the bird is inside or outside, whether she's in her sight or not in her sight, and then the dog howls too. <laughs> um, and then she says that she has a like a play stand that moves, and she'll take her in and out of the room if she's screaming, and you know, or put her someplace where where hopefully she won't scream. Um, and if she screams when when Debbie's home. She'll cover her, she'll go over and cover the cage, and she asks that, you know, she's heard they need lots of sleep, like 14 hours of sleep, and that maybe she needs to leave her covered longer in order to address the screaming problem. So, we got a few things here to address. Um, so, with, with vocalizing for attention, keep in mind that parrots are usually always with another bird out in the wild. They're usually not solo. So when they get separated from you know, their other companion, which in often cases us, they might offer a scream to see if they can find out where you are. And that first time that you responded to that, however you responded to it, whether you said shut up or what's the matter or went into the room and covered the cage or shut the door or even just walked by the hallway, that reinforces the behavior. And the evidence that you have that it's being reinforced is if the bird's doing it over and over and over again, that is your evidence that it's being reinforced. And so when she says she goes over and covers the bird, when Debbie says she does that, that's one of those big red flags to me because when that bird is screaming, the first thing that happens is you walked into the room. So the bird goes, yay, it worked, my screaming worked. Um, even though the bird got covered after that, what, what the bird learned in that moment is screaming got her to come into the room. So what we teach people who are trying to address this behavior problem is you have to become incredibly aware of what tiny things you might be doing that reinforce that behavior. You may be thinking, ah, oh, I'm ignoring him, I'm ignoring him, I'm ignoring him, I'm gonna wait till he does something good, but you know, your dog may be standing, because this happened in my house, my dog would be standing in front of the doorway where the parrot was, I wasn't, the bird couldn't see me, but the dog could see me and the dog was looking at me wagging his tail. You bet the parrot knew I was right there. So, so in the parrot's mind, you know, the sound he was making was working to get my attention. What you really have to do is think about everything. You know, is it the, the sound of the dishwasher opening? You know, your bird's screaming, you think you're ignoring him, I'm just gonna do dishes, but all those noises you're making are telling the bird, you're right here, you're right here. If he just keeps screaming, eventually she'll respond. So my response when a parrot is screaming for attention is I act like I've disappeared into thin air, that I've completely evaporated, and that your screaming caused me to evaporate into thin air. And so you want that bird to not be able to detect your presence at all. And then you do wait for something else that's acceptable that you can reinforce. So it could be the bird makes a cute little whistle, or says hello, or, or just a quieter vocalization, or maybe he is quiet for a few seconds. It's a little tougher to reinforce quiet. 
It's a lot easier if you can identify specifically sounds that you like. And the moment that bird makes a sound you like, boy, you want to make the biggest fuss ever. You want that little tiny sound to get much more attention than screaming ever got. And that will teach your bird that screaming doesn't work, this other sound works. Um, and you know, I always, I always use my own, bird, my own bird as an example. I have a blue-fronted Amazon that I've had for 27 years. And in her first year, I didn't know that much about training. And I totally taught her to scream for attention. And then I learned about training. And I very diligently worked on, OK, I'm never reinforcing screaming again. I'm only going to reinforce whistling. It took me about two weeks of being very diligent. She learned to whistle instead of scream for attention. And here we are 27, later, she almost never, 27 years later, she almost never screams. She pretty much only whistles. The only time she'll resort to a scream is if I've not responded to whistling for quite a while. It's kind of like my little reminder that, oh, shoot, I forgot to reinforce the whistling. So I'll just wait until she whistles again, and then I'll be sure to reinforce her. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that um, some people think they're doing a good job ignoring. But every once in a while, they make a mistake. You know, they walk into the room or the, there's a creak on the floor when they take a step and the bird goes, oh, that's it, I heard him. And I'll tell you what, that makes it even tougher to, to uh, get rid of this behavior because what you've done, remember that example I gave of teaching the, per the bird to sit on a perch for a long period of time and it's called that intermittent schedule of reinforcement. It never knows when it's gonna get reinforced so it learns to wait there a long time. That's exactly what's happening with these screaming parrots, is people are reinforcing every once in a while, and it teaches the bird strong, long duration. Keep trying, because eventually it'll pay off. It's just like pulling the handle of a, of a slot machine at a casino. If you keep doing it, eventually it'll pay off. So keep that in mind if you're dealing with a parrot that's screaming for attention. It could very well be that every once in a while you're reinforcing it, when in reality it has to be never gets reinforced again, and something else gets heavily reinforced so that the bird wants to do that behavior instead of the screaming. Remember that balance scale. So right now, screaming has a lot of value. A pleasant sound has none. We want to make pleasant to have all the value and uh, screaming to have no value. So again, another resource for you. Uh, so I have a blog about screaming for attention that kind of goes over all this and gives you some more examples. And um, I'll get, put the blog address up here in just a second. And just to tell you how to use it, when you go to the blog, there's a search box on the, right, on the right hand side of the page. You can type in screaming, that'll take you to this blog, but you can type in anything, you know, biting, fear responses, you know, parrots that don't want to be touched, trust, all that stuff. Type it in the box and it'll pull up all the blog. Baby parrots, it'll, it'll bring up all the blogs I have on those topics. So here's the address for the blog. Got it? Cool. Any other questions about screaming? Yeah, what if you're in the same room? Okay, that's a good one. If you're in the same room. Yeah, like a big area that's uh, like a big break room area. Okay. And if we're not paying attention to her or watching TV or something, she's screaming. So sometimes we just shut the TV off, go dark, and call, just kind of cut all the sound and sit there. But every so often, maybe uh, my husband's chair will rock and then we're agreeing. It, it could be if, if that's what she's seeking. So two things come to mind in that. One thing is that sometimes, um, you know, not all vocalizations are for attention. So a lot of our parrots, when the environment gets louder, so if the TV's loud, music's loud, we're talking loud, talking on the phone loud, a lot of times our parrots get loud with us. I don't think that's screaming for attention. It's more just like, hey, it's time to make noise. Everybody's making noise. So, um, so you might want to evaluate the situation to see if you think it's, that or if it is actually screaming for attention. If it is screaming for your attention, then um, uh, what I would do is I would walk away. I would, you know, the, but it has to be direct conjunction to when that bird does that vocalization. So the bird makes the vocalization, it wants your attention, you, you turn and walk away. And the moment that it stops vocalizing or presents another sound, you, you immediately go back and give her tons of attention for that. Yep, I see a hand. That's a good one. What if you've got several birds in the room and, and one screams and 
Okay, so I'm assuming you've got one you're trying to reinforce for the right behavior and another one that's doing the wrong behavior and you don't want to reinforce that one, right? That's the scenario. So I had that happen in my household. I, I uh, had a foster bird here for a little while. And I remember I said I have the Amazon that whistles. Um, and she was whistling like crazy, doing exactly what she's supposed to do, but the other one was screaming. So the nice thing about these nice long duration, um, these intermittent schedules of reinforcement getting duration, so my whist the bird whistling, that behavior was on a nice long interval now. So basically what I did is I waited for both birds to be doing correct behavior before I came into the room which is a little tougher, does take some finagling. If you know there's a situation where your bird is likely to scream, so let's say um, you know when you leave the room the bird's likely going to scream and the other one may not or whatever, you know, you might have something prepared for the moment you're gonna leave, like a new toy that you're gonna put in the enclosure or a foraging item or some special treats that are going in the bowl so that the bird gets focused on something else when you leave the room so you don't even set yourself up for the situation where you have to worry about um, how am I going to reinforce the right behavior? That's another option too. And those are all in the article. So. Can we put up that, or read that website again? Good morning. Oh, the, the blog? Yeah, here you go. It's uh, goodbirdinc.blogspot.com. Thank you. No problem. All right. So um, the other questions I got, uh, quite a few that were about feather damaging behavior. Oh, we had another question? Yes. I, okay, go for it. Parrots make good pets. Do parrots make good pets? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I am of the opinion that they do, based on my experience of, of working with parrots for, ah, God, I don't know, 30 some odd years now. I really think it's about what you do with them. Um, I have had a lot of people say they're inherently difficult, but I live in a household where my parrots don't bite, my parents, my parrots interact with other people, they don't scream for attention, um, and it's really because I was fortunate to learn about positive reinforcement training in my career and was able to apply it to my companion animals. So my personal experience has been that, that um, they can be incredible companion animals, they can have a good enriched life, and they can be very well behaved when we have the right information on how to influence behavior. So I don't see it as an inherent problem with parrots, it's just us knowing how to, um, how to influence behavior. Yep. Why do, I, and I think this ties back into um, what we're just talking about here is that people for many years were given some information that absolutely creates behavior problems. When people were told to make that bird obey the step up command, squirt it with water when it screamed, and um, all, all these really coercive techniques that do nothing to build trust with animals. I don't care if you're talking about a parrot, a dog, a cat, a horse, or anything, all these techniques absolutely damage our relationships with parrots or, or, or animals and they make it so that they are challenging to be with. So I really think it comes down to the information that people have received. Um, thankfully, you know, people like Dr. Club and Terry here are helping get information out that helps people address these problems. I don't, I don't for a second think those birds that are in rescues or sanctuaries are lost causes because the reality is, is behavior is flexible. Just like you learn for the rest of your life, hopefully we don't stop learning just because we turn a certain age, our behavior is constantly influenced by our learning experiences. And so um, same with, with uh, animals, their behavior is constantly influenced by their experiences. And so we can make those experiences good ones or bad ones. So we really play an important role on how their behavior comes out. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, one more. I see a hand. I can see waving or, or hand raising. <laughs> can you see us? I, I could say a blur. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you're there, and I, I'm sure uh, you guys are having a great time. Um, so I had one more thing I was going to mention, and then we'll take a few more questions from the audience. Um, there were quite a few questions about feather damaging behavior, and I am um, one of those folks that, that I, the way I view feather damaging behavior is, yes, there can be situations in which it's behavioral, but I also think there's a lot that... Um, 
to, to learn in, on the medical aspect still, and there's a lot of veterinarians that are still learning, if that makes sense. So just like if you had a particular medical condition, you might start out with a general practitioner, but then you would go to a specialist to really you know, get into the nitty gritty because you want that person that's been studying that and really is good at, at that particular problem. And, um, and I think, as you know, I'm so thankful we have avian vets out there, but not many of them get to see case after case of um, feather damaging behavior. It's kind of sporadic, and so they may not have all the tools and resources. So those of you that are de dealing with feather damaging behavior, I really, really recommend the vet who is hosting this fabulous event, Dr. Susan Club, because she's somebody who's put so much time and attention into feather damaging behavior. And the really cool thing about her is that she can consult via your existing veterinarian. So you don't necessarily have to go through all the same tests over and over again. She can look at the results that were already um, you know, acquired and she can tell you what other things might be a good strategy. Um, there were definitely some questions that came through that were like, oh, that is so a medical thing. You, you, know, you definitely want to see your vet on that. So if you don't know, I'm going to show you right now. Here is her website. <laughs> So pretty easy, SusanClub with two Bs.com. And I highly recommend you uh, you consider um, scheduling an, an appointment with her, a consulting appointment if you don't live in the area. You know, I, I, I'm, I know she works all around the country and the world, so um, I definitely recommend that if you're dealing with uh, that kind of problem. And, and she'll also, I'm sure, address behavioral aspects as well, but I really think a good medical do you know look over everything with the with the medical eye is really important especially with someone who's got a lot of experience with it so all right so so we still have a few minutes left if you guys have more questions i see another hand yes um we have a 17 year old tiffany gray okay uh, and um when she was i my race was a baby and when she was a baby i inadvertently taught her how to make poop on a basket. Okay. Unfortunately now, she will not poop in her cage. 17 years later, she holds it for the very first time. She now has, you know, bacteria, you know, physical problems. And I tried to, and maybe I'm just not consistent enough, put the basket in her cage with her on it. She looks at me like, you better, as soon as I pull it away from the cage, she poops. Okay. And how do you... She's 17 years old now. Yeah. How do you untrain? I mean, I have great clean cages, which is wonderful for clean Yeah. But it's really, I, I'm more concerned about her health at this point. How do you untrain that? Yeah, and, and that's, um, that's a great example. I, I do know of, um, I, I've actually worked with some other birds that have had that same problem, you know. So if you're one of those folks that's interested in training your bird to, you know, go potty on cue or, or go potty someplace, um, I always teach to do on a very sort of, general object like newspaper. Anywhere there's newspaper you can you can poo. So that means you can have newspaper next to you on the couch. You can have newspaper in the cage. You can have newspaper, you know, in the kitchen. You can have newspaper everywhere. So the bird learns to generalize the go potty behavior on newspaper. But as you mentioned, if they learn to only do it in one specific spot like a perch or or a basket or the toilet, then they they can learn to hold it until that opportunity exists. So I've definitely seen parrots that will hold it all day. Um, until the owner comes home and brings them over to that spot so that they can poop. So we absolutely fixed this with a parrot in Seattle, and I'll tell you how we did it. Um, this bird would only poop on a certain perch. So what we did is similar to what you looked like you were, you were going towards, is could I approximate that basket into the cage? And that's what we did with the perch. We basically kept bringing the perch um, closer, you know, but smaller steps. So, so maybe the perch is just a little bit closer to the cage and then a little bit more and a little bit more the next day. And then eventually we were, we, um, that top perch, we actually attached it to the inside door of the cage with the door open. So the bird sat on that perch and pooped there. And then we gradually worked towards closing the door. Now, because you've got a basket, it's a little tougher, but one thing you might consider is could you change the basket to newspaper? So that might mean you start with um, maybe um, newspaper underneath the basket. 
and then you maybe start gradually putting like a little piece of newspaper halfway over the basket and then over the top of the basket but eventually phase out the basket altogether and just transfer it transfer it to newspaper and you would also have to go through that process of gradually transferring it into her cage but think baby steps don't think you know all or nothing um, it might go faster than you think um, if you just break it down into a few more steps so you would advise getting rid of the basket altogether because there's newspaper in the bottom of the basket okay good then start raising it the out of her cage she'll poop everywhere else except in the cage okay so it's in the cage still on the perch and she'll poop fine okay in the cage so you just need to gradually work it towards in the cage that's, that's all. And, and I would put the news, you know, I know you said there's newspaper in the basket. Maybe start building it up so it's closer to the top and then eventually it's covering the basket. You know, just to phase out that whole basket component of being required. And, but get transferring it to a different object that can be generalized into her cage. But, you maybe you want to reinforce the treats? You can. Doesn't hurt. You know, going, going to the bathroom in itself is reinforcing. <laughs> but, but you can back it up with something else too. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thank you. But you can fix that one. That's a fixable one. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I see it one in the way back. Is there, is there any hope? Sure. So I have two of and a male has gotten really aggressive in the last few years since we put the female in with them. They're in an apiary together. Okay. So where would I start to, to learn how to do that? So you would, I, so just so I get this correctly, you, you want to keep him in the pair, but you would also like to be able to interact with this male of the, the two macaws. Correct. But, yeah, but so now lots of aggressive behavior. So what I, what I would look at is, so obviously you've got that, that pair bond going on there, and so there's, you know, all those things we talked about before that can contribute to aggressive behavior. But, um, but just keep in mind that it just means aggressive behavior is more easily triggered. It doesn't mean that the animal has to be aggressive. So you want to start being a little conscientious of what are the certain circumstances that cause him to be aggressive. And can you avoid those or can you train him to do something else in those moments? So like maybe he doesn't like it when you approach the female. So maybe you say, okay, well, you know, first I'm going to bring, I'm going to lure him over to a station and I'm going to give him lots of treats over here and maybe it's going to take two people that person's going to give him lots of treats and you're going to slowly approach the female and if he starts to leave the perch to come after you you back away wait for him to go back to the perch and reinforce him and then gradually work your way back towards towards the female um, so you can think of ways that you can train it I would always start with easy hands-off behaviors like targeting, which you can do from outside the enclosure, just to start getting him doing a behavior. And the nice thing with targeting is that you can use that to direct him where you want him to go without having him step up on your hand. So it gives you a way to, to uh, communicate and get him doing stuff without having to have your hands right in there. So I'd start with something simple like that and, and then build from there. But, you know, I, honestly, I do a lot of work with zoos, and, you know, most of the situations that we're training in there are that kind of situation where, you know, we've got, you know, kind of a protected contact situation, um, you know, there's potential danger if we do something wrong. So we find ways to work with animals that don't involve us getting right in there and build a relationship in different ways. He may not want to be cuddly with you guys like he was when he was a baby because he's got his mate now for that. But you can still have a relationship with him where he cooperates. But it'll be based on other kinds of reinforcers than cuddling. It might be based on favorite foods and things like that. Okay. Does anyone have a Chevy Malibu Barbara, thank you so much. All right. Next speaker coming up. Okay. And, uh, it was wonderful to have you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much.